All right, so we're going to finish up spine one with spondylolisthesis, spondylolysis, and then also a little bit about scoliosis. So spondylolisthesis is a forward slippage. Um, so uh, shown here, uh, basically. So here's your uh, normal spine. This is just showing you the area of the pars interarticularis, which is in between the sets here and the pedicles up here. Um, the uh, sp uh, spondylolysis phenomenon is shown here in the uh, center diagram. And then um, when that goes on to lead to this slippage, um, then here you can see L5S1 slippage where this is translating anteriorly, right? So there's different types of spondylolisthesis, dysplastic, isthmic, degenerative, post-traumatic, pathologic. The two main ones to know about are isthmic and degenerative. So isthmic has a couple of subtypes and then degenerative. We've already shown actually a couple of examples. If you go back to the last video, lumbar, degenerative spondylolisthesis, oftentimes in the lower lumbar spine, L4, L5, and L5S1. So there are grades and these are based on how much displacement. It's pretty straightforward, less than 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, 75 to 100, or greater than 100. And when you have greater than 100, the whole vertebral body is basically slipped, so to speak, off of the adjacent one, and you have something called spondyloptosis. So you grade it by, again, that percentage is shown by looking at the sort of diameter of the vertebral body here, um, and then sort of how much uh, there's slippage there, and then it's A over B is your percent of slippage. So degenerative spondylolisthesis is something we saw a little bit in the last video. It's due to degenerative changes. Uh, the lamina and pars are intact, so you do not have a spondylolysis shown in the prior diagram. Most common at L4, L5, more common in women greater than 40. They have back pain. It's worse with bending, walking, lifting. It's better with lying down. They can have leg pain and radiculopathy. Uh, and if you have spinal stenosis, you can also get neurogenic claudication. It goes hand in hand a lot of times with um, uh, lumbar um, degenerative disease. On physical exam, you potentially may palpate a step off of the spinous processes, especially in a high grade slip. Um, you potentially can have motor sensory um, uh, uh, changes, but uh, not always. Uh, but you do a thorough neuro exam, motor sensory reflexes in the lower extremities, and um, imaging. You typically get plane films, and you often can get these dynamic views, right? So flexion extension views, where you try to see is, if there's any. Uh, slippage noted or any worsening of existing slippage seen on static images. Uh, so flexion extension views are a dynamic phenomenon you often cannot get with like an MRI even. Um, if you want to evaluate how much stenosis there is, um, you can also see this on an MRI. So here's an example of uh, flexion extension view. So here you can see extension right on the left and then a flexion view here and sort of the um, mid position view and uh, image B. So what you're looking here is to see, you know, is there any worsening of spondylolisthesis? And you can see certainly if you look at this here compared to here, you can see flexion versus extension. There certainly is a uh, dynamic degree of instability there. And here's MRI imaging. So treatment non-operative. Uh, Sometimes a weight loss program can help, low impact muscle strengthening, endurance programs, NSAIDs. Uh, try to stay away from opioids if possible. Injections can help. In some cases, you may have to do a spinal fusion and decompression. Now, the isthmic spondylolisthesis is when you get this, um, you get this spondylolysis, right? And it's most common in children and young adults. And you get this so-called defect, also sometimes just called a stress fracture here. And you can have spondylolysis without spondylolisthesis, or you can go on and develop spondylolisthesis. This is something you see more in gymnasts, a lot of hyperextension activities, football players, another example.
It can be asymptomatic, and sometimes you just pick up on these things. They certainly can present with back pain, uh, radiculopathy, ham, uh, radiculopathy, hamstring tightness, um, physical exam, can you palpate for step offs if there's a significant uh, spondylolisthesis, uh, neurovas or, I'm sorry, neuro, uh, yeah, neurovascular exam, and then uh, potentially you may notice decreased lumbar lordosis, uh, flattening of the buttock. Um, Again, it's spondylolisthesis, right? So you can consider getting dynamic views, uh, MRI again. Now, SPECT CT um, or, and bone scanning, these can be done to look for the spondylolysis or the uh, kind of stress fracture. You often will miss this on an MRI scan. So uh, CT imaging is helpful. Here you can see that defect in the pars interarticularis, right? And a very um, classic finding is a so-called um, Scotty dog and sort of the broken neck or collar of the Scotty dog. And we'll show that in the next slide. But if you look at an oblique image of the lumbar spine, you can sort of put the um, pars interarticularis in, in profile and you sort of get these shadows that look, I'll show you in the next slide, uh, like this dog, right? And uh, again, you're looking at, uh, you know, right, this is the head of the dog and here's the body of the dog here, right? So on that oblique view, if you see this line here, and certainly if there's a big line and a gap, that's an, an, an oblique x-ray, you could potentially diagnose a spondylolysis and a spondylolisthesis. So treatment in adolescence, typically bracing for an active painful pars defect or spondylolysis is the other term for that. Um, if you have low grade spondylolisthesis, you can brace them. Uh, in adults, uh, you can often also treat non-surgically. Um, sometimes rigid bracing is tough. Um, and in bad cases, you may have to do surgery. So let's finish up with scoliosis. So I'm gonna focus mostly on adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So this is the common form that you're mostly going to hear about. So scoliosis is a lateral curvature of the spine greater than 10 degrees. Now, it's not a pure lateral curvature. There's a sagittal component as well. We uh, measure these angles with something called the Cobb method. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. Usually it's a combination of uh, thoracic and uh, lumbar curves. Sometimes it's just a thoracic curve the compensatory you know, lumbar curve or not. Um, there are other forms of scoliosis, congenital scoliosis, neuromuscular scoliosis, etc. cetera, uh, but we'll focus mostly on the so-called AIS, or adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Now, this is the kind of disease that you may see in a young teenager that gets screened at school and um, then goes, goes into a brace, and here you can see examples of scoliosis, and on the right-hand side, patient treated with... Uh, spinal fusion procedure. So on assessment, they're usually asymptomatic. These are things that are often picked up on screening, except in really severe cases. Now, if you do a forward bending test, which is one of the screening tests done, it becomes a little bit more apparent. Uh, and you can see in the top left, the so-called rib hump here, uh, demonstrated by the phenomenon shown down here due to the uh, deformity. So you have a curvature and sort of rotation of the spine that takes place. And because it's in the thoracic spine, the rib cage gets deformed as well. Certainly you're going to do a neurologic examination. You're going to um, determine skeletal maturity, get uh, full length standing radiographs where you can see the entire spine kind of shown like here. And um, oftentimes you get an MRI to rule out other causes. So whereas if you see AIS enough times, you recognize it's really not something an MRI is going to help with, but there are unusual cases that can cause scoliosis that you, you, know, you know, certainly don't want to miss. And MRI is really just to rule out other causes. Now, a word about skeletal maturity. This is really important. Um, if you think about it, um, a de, you know, the deformity can progress with uh, the bones growing. So if you have a bad deformity, 
in a very skeletally immature patient. What I mean by that is somebody who still hasn't hit their growth spurt, right? Is a kind of common term for that. So if they have bad deformity and haven't hit their growth spurt yet, when they hit their growth spurt, that deformity is really going to accelerate. So the bones are going to grow, they're not set up in a straight position, and that curve is going to get a lot worse. Whereas somebody who's almost neared skeletal maturity, um, that deformity probably is not going to get that much worse, right? So whenever we're determining how to treat patients, we always take into account skeletal maturity, right? Um, it's going to affect, um, you know, it could make the difference between one patient having to get surgery and not. So curves less than 25 degrees usually are observed. Skeletally immature, progressive curves, 25 to 45 degrees, oftentimes you're going to get braced and braced like almost 24 hours. And if you have a skeletal immature patient with a big curve, um, 45 degrees, or a mature, skeletal mature patient with a really big curve, a lot of times you're going to need surgical treatment fusion. These patients can be set up for back pain. They can be set up for respiratory problems. Um, if they're allowed to um, just um, be untreated with massive uh, deformities. Um, there's a really good little video I do want to play here for you. Uh, it's from a hospital, but it's um, it, perhaps a bit promotional, but I think it's, it's a really, really nice little illustration of what this is all about. Scoliosis surgery. Your surgeon uses screws and rods to straighten your spine and hold the spine in place until a solid bridge of bone forms. First, the surgeon removes the facet joints. This frees your spine and allows your surgeon to see where to place the screws. Next, the surgeon inserts special screws, called pedicle screws, into the bone. The screws will stay safely inside the bone of each vertebra. After the screws are all in, the surgeon carefully feeds a straight metal rod into each screw head. The surgeon uses it to slowly straighten out your spine, correcting your scoliosis. Do you see how the posture is slowly changing? The shoulders are becoming more level, and the ribs start to return to normal. your scoliosis doesn't come back, the surgeon will make a bone graft. Remember the facet joints? The surgeon combines those with other parts of your spine that you don't need anymore, called the spinous processes. Then he or she mixes them into a material to place on your spine. Over time, this material becomes part of your spine. Your bone heals and forms a solid column around the screws and rods. And there it is! That's how we improve and stabilize your scoliosis. Alright, so hopefully that uh, helped explain things a little bit better for you. And I'm um, actually going to end there and um, we'll uh, talk about uh, emergencies and uh, trauma in the uh, next uh, lecture series of videos. Thanks.